my name is Jeff Tollickson. I'm here in the Schmidt College of Science and also with the Institute for Quantum Studies at Chapman. And uh, we have been greatly uh, honored to have uh, Professor Andrew Jordan from the University of Rochester in New York, where I'm told it is now snowing and extremely cold. So it's really, he really, it was really hard for him to leave. Um, to come here, but he's coming. He's also come with his whole team from Rochester. So uh, Cyril is uh, uh, one of his postdocs. Hi, Cyril. And uh, Shang Shi is another postdoc coming soon, and several other folks. Um, so Andrew, uh, he works in what field? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Physics and in and, and quantum and. Um, he works in a field called Foundations of Quantum Theory, which means sort of the underpinnings of the whole show, and he works in something called quantum thermodynamics and, and several other things. Um, and, but this talk is intended to be uh, a quantum mechanics in the human language, as opposed to mathematics or something like that. So this is intended to be understandable, and although Andrew's a, a theorist, he's actually gonna do some experiments, yes? Um, so we have all of our, our uh, laboratory equipment here set up for him to go. Um, and I suppose we should also thank some of your sponsors, right? Or are you going to thank them? Well, I, in particular, um, we should thank the Simons Foundation. Uh, so Andrew has won, I think, just about every imaginable prestigious uh, grant and so on and so forth, but the Simons Foundation is particularly nice because that allowed you to spend a whole year sabbatical here. Um, and one of his other colleagues also won, and I loved her quote when they, when they made the announcement. I have to read it. She's an astronomer, and she said, quote, this is a great time to drop everything and go away and go work on the galaxy. So <laughs> that's kind of what we do here. Um, so. Uh, with no further ado, I give you uh, Professor Andrew Jordan. Okay, can you hear me all right? All right, so, so as Jeff said, this is a talk that's not intended to a few of the experts that I see in the room. It's not for you, not for you, but it's for everyone else. So those, those of you that don't know what quantum mechanics is, is all about, I'm going to try to give you a flavor of that today, and I have to acknowledge, even before I begin properly, uh, Christian Bourgeois had the great idea to theme this talk around, I was originally going to call it strangeness in quantum mechanics, but he said, why don't you call it stranger things in quantum mechanics? I thought it was brilliant, so I'm, I'm stealing Christian's idea, so that's the theme of the talk, and I love this poster Chapman made for, for, the, uh, for the talk. And so part of my background research that I've been undertaking in order to prepare myself properly to give this seminar is been studying by watching episodes of Stranger Things uh, in a back-to-back uh, -back fashion. So I'm happy to report that last night I finished the last episode of season two, and so I'm completely caught up. So I'm equipped to answer any questions you have about <laughs> the physics of Stranger Things, no problem. And so as part of that homage to, to, to uh, Stranger Things and indirectly, of course, to Chapman University, I've woven some of those uh, themes and topics into the context of my talk uh, as a kind of a fun, fun element. So I wanted to uh, start off just by saying uh, thanks, thanks to Chapman University for hosting me. I'm here on sabbatical, as Jeff said, from the University of Rochester. I always have a great time when I come to Chapman. We do great things, and a great big part of that is because of the institute here, uh, part of the university, and of course I enjoy hanging out with, with Jeff and Yakir. And of course, uh, Justin and Matt and all the other uh, great people here at the University of uh, Chapman University. And in particular, there's a great uh, journal that, that Jeff and Yakir started that I think I'm a member of the editorial board on as well, Quantum Studies. And this has been a great uh, journal, and I've, been, I've enjoyed participating in that too. So it's great to be here. So thank you for hosting me. It's been great so far. By the way, Andrew, your, your paper in that is the number one downloaded paper, so like 20,000 downloads. All right, very good. Okay, so, so, so what is this all about? Uh, I want to begin my lecture by talking about some of the spooky aspects of quantum mechanics, some of the stranger things. So, so if you watch Stranger Things, you know it's a spooky story on television. 
uh, and, and spookiness has entered also into quantum mechanics, not recently, but a long time ago. And so the spook of quantum mechanics uh, was introduced by these guys. Uh, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein had a famous a dialogue back and forth in the 1930s about the true meaning of quantum mechanics. And that dialogue has been going on uh, until the present day. And so one of the great letters, they had this beautiful letter exchange. And one of the great letters uh, Albert Einstein was writing to Niels Bohr, I, mean, I circled this, this excerpt here. He writes, uh, he's talking about quantum formalism, the existing formalism. <clears throat> I cannot seriously believe in it because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent a reality. This is where I'll be coming back to again and again in this talk. A reality in time and space free from spooky actions at a distance. Uh, and this is the German word. Uh, you can see the spook coming in here. Uh, and, so, and so this is where this idea of spooky action at a distance comes in. What, what's this all about? And I'll be telling you about that as we go on in the talk. But I also kind of love this, this section down here at the, at, the, at the bottom of the letter just to prove that times never really change. They just sort of morph faces. He says, I'm glad your life and work are so fruitful and satisfying. It helps to bear the craziness of the people who determine the fate of homo sapiens on the grand scale. Maybe it has never been any better, but one did not see it as clearly in all its wretchedness. So, I, uh, uh, all right, so there you go. Um, so quantum mechanics, what's it all about? Well, it's about uh, some of the spooky things that appear are like the Duffer Brothers' creation here. Uh, the, one of the monsters in the first season of, uh, of Stranger Things. We have similar kind of monsters that appear in quantum mechanics and our discussions of quantum mechanics. And one of those monsters I was talking about is Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> so we'll be talking about Schrodinger's cat and what, what this uh, strange monster is all about. And furthermore, just like, just like uh, the, the, the heroes in Stranger Things managed eventually to conquer uh, the, the Demogorgon, as they call it, well, thinking about how we can conquer Schrodinger's a cat by understanding its true nature. Right, so we'll, let, let's talk about some of the stranger things in quantum mechanics. We're talking about, and I want to stress that, that usually um, one of the things I mentioned in the, in the advertisement of this talk is I give a summer lecture series, and usually a week-long course, three hours a day, five for five days. I'm just trying to sort of squeeze some of that uh, content into one hour lecture, a little, maybe a little bit more than an hour lecture and give you a flavor of some of these things. So there's a lot more to say about this. I'm just going to touch on some of the maybe most interesting aspects for you today. And so here are some of the strange creatures we'll mention. I just mentioned Schrodinger's cat, but this idea of particle wave duality, this strange notion of spooky action and distance. That's what, that's what EPR means. That e is Einstein. Uh, entanglement, or also sometimes called Bell non-locality, something I'll call filters that aren't filters. And then this idea of quantum measurement, quantum ideas of quantum measurement, differ in a very fundamental way from classical ideas of measurement. And then this introduces this idea of the role of the observer becomes not only an observer, but also a participant. Okay. So just as a, as a beginning uh, uh, basic, uh, some basic facts about quantum physics, first of all, it's the physics of small things. So this is something that we discovered by understanding how matter behaves on its smallest length scales. Uh, around the turn of the century. And one way of quantifying the physics of small scales is by giving you a, a, a scale, a, a typical size scale. And that's sort of the special constant of quantum mechanics. And we call that Planck's constant. And we write it in this funny letter, an H with a, a cross or a stroke through the, through the handle of the H. Uh, and it has a certain value. The value, don't, don't worry about the numbers in front. Just look at the exponent, 10 to the minus 34. And then look at the units. So the units of this is a J times an S, which stands for a joule times a second. And that's a unit of energy times a unit of time. So, so one joule, if I take a tomato off the table and I lift it up about this high, I'm doing about one joule's worth of work. And you all know what a second is. It's about the time, you know, a, a time interval <laughs> like that. So that gives a scale of our humans' uh, interactions of time and energy. That's, that's our human scale. And you see the quantum scale is about 34 orders of magnitude smaller than that time scale. So that's, that's the kind of size scale we're talking about. And one of the amazing things is that, uh, that, that requires a fundamental rethink of how physics works is that when we talk about particle in classical physics, we talk about its position, its momentum, or its velocity. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. 
We don't really talk about these as fundamental things anymore. Uh, we, we, think, we think about another kind of quantum, uh, another kind of description. We, we have a quantum description. And that quantum description will be called the wave function, or the quantum state of that thing. And that plays the role of specifying the position and the velocity of the particle. And one of the neat things about that it comes along for that is something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is quite fundamental. And it states that, that the uncertainty, that's what this delta symbol means, the uncertainty in our knowledge about a particle's position, that's what x means, times the uncertainty about its momentum. Momentum is just mass times velocity of the particle must fundamentally be bigger than some number in the same number h bar I'm talking about. Okay? So that's another sort of basic concept, and quantum mechanics will become important for us. Uh, in classical physics, this, does, this inequality does not exist. I can know position and momentum simultaneously of a particle as precisely as I want to know. So the fact that there is this bound on how precisely uh, the uncertainty of these quantities is, uh, uh, is provided for us, that's a new feature that quantum mechanics so if I combine these two elements, I combine this idea of Planck's constant and uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and I start playing around with the physics I might learn in an introductory physics class. Maybe you've, you've, some of the younger people in the audience have taken some basic Newtonian mechanics, electricity and magnetism, and you learn, learn about force laws and how things particles move under the influence of the force. So if you combine those kinds of classical thinking together with these principles as well, that gives you a typical size scale of, for example, the atom. So the, the hydrogen atom, that's the simplest uh, atom we have, is just a neutron, which is a positively charged particle, an electron, which is a negatively charged particle, bound together in one object we call the atom. And a typical size scale of the atom, if you put these things with classical physics, gives you about 10 to the minus 10 meters. Okay, so a meter you know, is about this big, and so if I, if I reduce that by 10 orders of magnitude, that gets me to the size of the atom. So uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the basic features of quantum mechanics. And, and if you read Liter Richard Feynman's uh, lecture notes, he has a beautiful way of explaining things. And he likes to say that, that if you understand a very simple thing about quantum mechanics, namely this experiment I'm about to tell you about, then you can really understand the rest of the mysteries of quantum mechanics by thinking back to this basic elemental mystery. So let me tell you about this mystery. And it's not hard to describe what it is but it is hard to wrap your mind around. Okay, so this is true not only for venomuses, the people that are learning it for the first time, it's equally true for the experts, the people that have spent our entire careers thinking about this. It's just as mysterious, we just sort of get used to the mysteriousness after a while. And so this is sort of a cartoon uh, kind of representing a little bit of, 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 of this. You see the skier going both ways around the tree, and there's this element of truth to this cartoon. So let me describe that. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to tell you about three different experiments. The first experiment is an experiment with particles, or you can think about them as bullets coming from a gun. And the idea is that I have a screen or a firing range I'm firing these bullets at, and the screen has a couple of holes in them. I'm going to be shooting those bullets through the holes, and then, at the, and then after some further distance later, I have a, uh, a backstop here. I'm going to look at see where the particles or the bullets land at the end of the day after they traverse these two holes, if they get through and land on this backstop. And we're going to do this many times because we find that a single bullet, suppose the bullet is not super precise and has some kick and some fluctuations associated with it, will have some spread of the particle positions and where these guys land. And what you see after you do this experiment with bullets is that the bullets either go through the top slit, number one, or the bottom one, number two, and then furthermore, a line uh, collide with this backstop. <coughs> so, the actual distribution of particles or bullets that I see will have this form. It'll have sort of a broad shape on the backstop. And furthermore, if I look at the particles as they pass either through hole one or hole two here, if I did experiments where just hole one or hole two was exposed, I would get these distributions of bullets on the backstop as well. And what I want to point out to you is simply that if I want to know the, the distribution with both holes open, I can simply add up these two distributions separately, and I'll get the same distribution at the end. So you think about it as the whole is the sum of the parts. So this is not, I don't have my crazy uh, orange font here because this is something perfectly 
reasonable, something you would be perfectly at home with, that you, you can go home and play with marbles in, in your basement. So one of the experiments that I do with my students is I have to actually construct a little board that I roll marbles down, and we do this experiment to be able to build up these uh, distributions in my class. So moving on, I want to talk about a second experiment, and that's an experiment with waves. So you all know about this too, you've played with waves in your bathtub, for example, or you go out on the lake and you drug through a pebble into the pond and you watch the waves move away from their source where you threw the pond, uh, the pebble into the pond. And so we're thinking about an experiment where again, we have uh, say a, a, a rock you throw in the middle of the lake, it makes these circular waves that disturb and go out away from the, the, where the rock hits. And then again, we're gonna have now, we think about it as a dock, a dock in the, in, in the lake, and the dock has, a two, again, two holes in it. <coughs> and we're gonna look at the disturbances of the water waves as they go through these two holes. And what you see if you follow the crests and the troughs of the waves is that they come through these two holes separately and come along, and then later on, if I have, for example, if I have a child here sitting on the shore of this lake, and sitting in, standing knee deep in the water, and I'm going to think about him as a detector and how much the water comes up or down in his leg is my, his measurement of how big the intensity of the wave is or how big uh, the, the, the movement of the wave is on his leg, for example. And something interesting happens when the child that was walking along the, the bank from one side to the other, so he finds something curious, which is that sometimes he finds that there is a, butt, a big wave, the wave is going up and down in his leg quite a lot, but then sometimes, other times, at a different point on the shore, he finds the, the movement of the wave is very small. Okay? So this phenomenon where I have these crossing waves adding together, and sometimes what we see is that we think about the, the, the crest of the wave add and give me a big wave, but then sometimes the crest of the wave adds with the trough of the wave and gives me no wave at all. So that phenomenon we give it a name, we call that interference. So, so, so if I looked at just the intensity with just one wave closed, how, how much the water would go up in my leg, or the other one, I would see the same types of intensities I saw in the previous graph. But now what I see if I had them both open is I had this kind of intensity that wiggles like so. Okay. So this phenomenon where the total wave intensity uh, adds up like this, we call that uh, interference pattern. Okay. So again, this is something we can understand in a very simple way using concepts of wave. But in quantum mechanics, um, as Feynman liked to say, quantum mechanics involves things that's very different from anything else we've experienced. Different from particles, different from waves, different from fluids, different from clouds, different from any other kind of experience. It's a new kind of animal in some sense. So let's talk a little bit about that. So before I do that, I can also talk about an experiment with light. And I can do this experiment right now. So, so Justin's going to come up and help me uh, with my experiment with light. But the idea is I'm just going to have a light source. This could be something very simple, like the sun, for example, or a, or a lamp. It can go through a slit, so say to purify it into a single source, and then putting it through two slits, and then I can get the same interference pattern uh, at, at, the, at the end of my detector, just like it is the water wave. So this gives evidence to suspect maybe light is like a water wave. It's a, it's a wave. So we can do this experiment. And you can do this even at home if you take a, a hair from your head and you take that hair and you, and you put it up against the light, <coughs> say a pinpoint of light in the distance. Okay, it, it, it's probably easier at night. So try, it's, it's just a homework, homework assignment for you. Tonight, go out, find a street light, and then pass a hair in front of the street light, and you'll see fringes. So we're going to be able to do another experiment that's like that with a laser so, so, so a laser is just a coherent source of light. That means the light source that has its waves and troughs all going in one way, unlike the sunlight. And I'm going to have here just a card with a, with a wire on it. And so the wire plays the role of that middle barrier here and makes the light go one way or the other around it. So let's see what happens when I put that. Uh, why don't you help me? Yeah, so you see it, when the wire comes in front of the photo, you see this line of light here. And if you look closely, you see that there's inter interchanging bright, dark, bright, dark, little spots like that. That's the interference effect. That's when the, the waves and the troughs are interfering with each other and producing either constructive, where, the, where it's brighter light, or destructive interference. Okay? So that's an example of interference right there with the light source, just like I have on this slide there. Thank you, Justin. 
So um, what, what we're going to think about now is, a, is a, one more experiment, and that's going to be the sort of the, you know, the more mysterious one, which is that we can think about if we know something new, which is that light in its most basic form is not just waves, but it's made up of little particle-like things we call photons, discrete bundles of energy. We learned that also around the turn of the century. <coughs> There's a mystery, which is that how can these little particles display this effect of interference? Because if they're like particles, they should be like the bullets, right? So let's think about another experiment, which is an experiment with electrons. So I can imagine having electrons, which is a small particle. It's a, 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 as far as we know, it has no size associated with it. Uh, it's negatively charged. And we think about them as little granules in our minds, like something weird happens. If I, if I start shooting them out of this gun, and I have them go through two slits just like I had before, and look at where they land over here, what you see is something weird. They don't land like the bullets, they land like the waves. Even though they're single they're particles, they land in these uh, little strips, like they have a constructive and a destructive here. <coughs> now, what do you think about that? Any ideas why that might behave that way? Well, some people might say maybe it's because these electrons are charged and they have some interaction, so maybe they like to repel or repel and attract from each other. And so maybe it's some kind of collective effect. But what people can do is they can actually turn down the, the intensity of this gun very, very weak. So I only have one electron at a time that goes through this pattern. It goes through either this slit or this slit, naively speaking. And it still lands here. And what we find is it still was the same kind of pattern in the work. So I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But it leads to something very puzzling: that if we have uh, th this this uh, th this effect, uh, we have to somehow see, say that each particle somehow knows about the presence of both slits uh, in order to be able to produce this interference pattern. So we can think about that, but a single electron that somehow goes over over both roads both roads to get to this final position at the same time. And this is sort of the first spookiness of quantum mechanics that, that emerges. Now let's, let's say a little bit more about that. Uh, <coughs> so we can think about these particles as not really particles. They're sort of like particle waves or wavy particles, or really something, as fine and stress, something completely different. It's really neither. It's some new kind of behavior that we don't really have a category for in our mind. So one of the ways you see this is quite interesting is if I did that experiment that I described for you where you do electrons one at a time through these double slits, and I'd just be able to record them. If I only had a few electrons, what you see here is something that looks like just sort of a random pattern. It looks like electrons are just sort of piercing in irregular positions. So this is maybe the first funny thing about quantum mechanics. It doesn't, predict, it doesn't predict the outcome precisely, but it predicts something about the statistics of the outcome. But as I, as I expose it for longer and longer periods of time, so, so for B, uh, slide B is a, a small time, then C, then D, then E, and you see that over time I build up these patterns of a constructive versus destructive interference. Okay, so this is our first uh, quantum mystery, the fact that some electron goes from here to there, detected and emitted as a particle, and yet somehow knows about both, uh, both slits at the same time. Uh, let me stop there and ask if you have any questions about that. Yes? What if there are more than two slits? Would there be interference? Good question. So what happens if there are three slits? So, so um, maybe, maybe, maybe first thing, uh, yeah. So what happens with three slits is that you still get interference, but the pattern is more complicated. Okay, so, so you might have you might have more wiggles in the same space. Okay, so the reason I choose two instead of say three or seven or twelve is simply because the, the, it's the most simple example to illustrate this effect. But you're absolutely right. So if you have three slits or four slits, they have uh, they will have a similar effect. And in fact, if you have many slits, a bunch of slits, it's something called a diffraction grating. And so maybe I'll show you that. Do you have do you have the diffraction grating? And so we can see that also with the laser light. Here's, it's like producing many slits at, in one, and what do you see is you see something like this. So you see these kind of patterns here is produced from that single light, light beam hitting this pattern of uh, 
hitting this pattern of slits, like many of them I, as I just described, and you see that you have not only just bright and dark spots, but many spots that are bright, 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 and then everywhere else is dark. This is sort of an extreme example of constructive and destructive. So let me talk a little bit about how, <coughs> excuse me, how we describe this quantum phenomenon. But to do that, I want to go back briefly to classical physics. And in classical physics, I have certain coordinates that I use to describe them. I have, for example, a position and a momentum. So again, a momentum is just the mass of a particle times its velocity. So once I have these coordinates, this allows me to be able to describe, for example, a configuration of uh, atoms in a gas as a point in some many dimensional space. So in the simplest case of say, say one particle, I would have one position and one momentum and, I, and, I, and by indicating where it is, that tells me where I am. So that's my coordinate space for classical physics. In quantum mechanics, I just told you we have to give up on that. We can't have a precise momentum and position anymore. I give up on that. I have a new kind of coordinate. Oh yeah, but before I do that, yes, so I can think about how that coordinate moves in time. And this, for example, like a pendulum moving back and forth, I think about the, the position and its velocity uh, versus time, or in the phase space I just talked about. And of course, there are more complicated examples as well. But this notion of trajectory tells me how a, a coordinate changes in time in the classical world. When I go to quantum mechanics, though, I have to give up on that. And I introduce this new thing, this wave function, psi. And so this is like our quantum coordinate. We call it states or wave functions or density operators, depending on who you're talking to, what you're talking about. And the thing about these states is it's no longer some deterministic thing. So, so if I go back a bit, I know I start here. I know after a while I'm going to end up for sure there. In quantum mechanics, it's not that way anymore. Uh, these are intrinsically probabilistic things that tell me something about the odds of what I'm going to find when I look at the system. Okay, and I'll get more into that in a minute. But here's some example, for example, of the hydrogen atom I was talking about before. Here's some collection of its wave function. Maybe you've seen, remember, from your chemistry books in high school. So these are our quantum coordinates, and we talked about how those coordinates move around too, and that allows us to be able to predict the, uh, the system. So for example, for the two-slit system, uh, yeah, so this is Erwin Schrodinger. He was the one of the guys that, that really came up with this idea. Uh, and, and if I think about, let me go back a bit, if I think about these coordinates applied to this kind of thing, uh, essentially the mathematics is actually quite simple. The idea is I would say I describe one wave function or, or that goes uh, one way through the slit. I have another wave function that goes the other way through the slit. And then I, my prediction for what happens in the slit is simply the sum of those two wave functions. Okay? So it works just like electricity math. Or the, I'm sorry, it just works just like the wave example I gave before, like this. I add up these two things and I, I, turn, I, have, to turn, I have to square it to get to the answer. But what's really different from the waves is that it's not talking about some continuous thing anymore. It's talking about discrete events. A particle lands here. And so all I can do is I can tell you about what the probability of that particle landing there is. And that's the essence of quantum. All right. So let's go back forward. So I want to give you some examples, and, and more examples that I like are, are very simple examples, the simplest kind of thing, which is just like the two-slit experiment has only two possibilities. I go through the upslit or the downslit. Here's another simple example, which is sometimes we call it an, an, an analogy to a, to a bit, or a zero or a one. That's a classical bit. So, I mean, sometimes we have now uh, the possibility of being in the state zero. This, this is what this little bracket here means. We just call it, it's just a state of reality or state of existence. And then the one is the state of reality of being in one. And then I just simply add them together with some amplitude, just like I did, talked about for the two-slit experiment a minute ago. And this provides some, what we call quantum superposition of states one and zero, like being in the upper slit or the slower slit, I have a quantum superposition of those two things. And uh, this provides me what sometimes is called a qubit, or, 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 or a way of computing with quantum bits, which I'll get back to. So uh, one of the interesting things is, is that if I measure this system now, if I do a measurement, I look at it through whatever means you, you like to give me. I can look at it with a microscope or with some electri electrical detector or whatever. It doesn't matter. That's anything like quantum mechanics. It completely doesn't matter what the detector is. It says, I'll find result zero. If I, if I look for these guys, 
with some probability, some fraction of the time, it turns out to be related to the square of this, of this coefficient, uh, that fraction of the time, and I'll find it to be result one, some other fraction of the time, the coefficient, this coefficient squared. Okay? And so, that, so that's what all quantum mechanics tells you, is the probabilities of finding these results. And then if I repeat them many, many times, that's how I can confirm that this is an accurate prediction of what's going to happen, because it's a, it's a statistical prediction. Uh, but what's weird about quantum mechanics is I don't have to measure just zero or one. I could measure in some kind of crazy uh, superposition way. I could say, what's the, what's the probability that the system is not in zero or one, but in something other else, like zero plus one, or zero minus one, whatever that means. All right, so I'll talk more about that in a minute. So then I get different results depending on what those things, but related to the same state that I introduced at the beginning. So I want to give you some examples of this. And, and the simplest example, oh yeah, so, so, so what's, what's also real cool about it, and, I'll, and, and this is my last abstract thing, is that when I measure it, what happens? This is, so in, in the classical world, if I measure a system, I can measure like my backpack. I look at it, nothing happens to the backpack. The backpack is here, it's doing it's exactly the same thing it was doing a minute ago. Uh, in quantum mechanics, that doesn't happen anymore. When I measure something, it changes it, all right? So, so this is what we call wave function collapse. So it starts in this state. When I measure it, if I find result zero happen, what happens is that this state is destroyed, and it's replaced with this new state, zero. Or if I find result one, the new state is just one, okay? So this collapse of the wave function is very, somehow mysterious, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And so maybe it's important to be uh, stressed so you don't ever usually see these superposition states. You just see the state that you measure, 0 or, or 1. Okay. So let's give an example. We can actually learn how this works in a very simple way by using uh, uh, properties of light. Okay. So, so Justin, will you help me by passing these out? Or maybe you can get Jeff to pass them because I need you up here. Okay. okay. And so light, it turns out, has a hidden variable. Maybe you didn't know about it all these years. The light has its own brightness and its own, if I have a beam of light, it has a direction. But there's something hidden about light that only is revealed if I look at it you know, with the special apparatus. And the special apparatus I have is this little piece of film here. And we're going to be able to deduce properties of light just by playing with this piece of film. All right? So Justin, why don't you give me the light beam on the, uh, on the board? And what I see, if I put the film in front of it, you see that all that happens <coughs> is that maybe the, the intensity of the beam goes down a little bit, but nothing really happens, right? It's sort of there, it's a little bit brighter. If I turn it, you see, nothing also, nothing really happens. If I turn it, it's just a, it's sort of a little bit darker. So all that's happening is I'm reducing this. You might think this is just a bit of colored plastic, very boring. But something magical happens if I take two of these and put them together. And with the pieces of, uh, of these films that Je Jeff is handing out, you can see it for yourself. But if I have this film like this, it looks just like everything else, but now I turn it, and then as I turn it, something interesting happens, which is that part of the light gets blocked out. Okay? So you see that as I turn these guys, I turn them orthogonal to each other. I'm oh, sorry. You see that the light, the light on this whiteboard is almost completely blocked out by the uh, by the uh, these two pieces of film. So something is funny happening as I rotate one film to the other, it blocks something out, right? So that thing we give it a name. We call it polarization. Okay, and one of the things that happens with polarization is you see here that if I have the two black pieces of the film aligned in the same direction, I have them, I just have a reduction of intensity that's the same after these guys. But then if I turn that piece of film like this, I extinguish the light entirely. So we call this, uh, we say polarization can have one or two states. We'll call it H or V, H for horizontal, V for vertical. And this is like the bit I was talking about before, zero or one is the state of reality of this light. It's either V or it's H. It has two hidden realities you didn't know about. So, 
So you might think, aha, what, what are these polarizers? This, this is a name. I'm going to call this, give it a name too. We'll call this a polarizer. What are these polarizers doing? Well, you might say they're acting kind of like filters, right? So you say that their light has, comes in two flavors, this H flavor and this V flavor. And one of these guys is filtering out the H flavor, and the other guy is filtering out the B flavor. So I put them both together, I filter out both H and V, right? So leaving nothing behind. So it's a filter. But now I've got the filters that aren't filters. So we'll call them H and V. So we think about these, what I just told you. The first one filters out H, the first second one filters out V. But it turns out it's not that simple uh, because I can do something else. So Justin, come here. So yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna block these two out. So this is basically blocked out. Well, it's there, there's blocked out. Now this is gonna put a third filter in at some other angle. And what happens? When he puts the filter in, what happens? It gets brighter. You see that? So when the filter, when these two filters are orthogonal, it's, it, it, it's you would think that this would be completely blocked out, but when the third one comes in, suddenly I get light out again. So, the, so, so if it were just that simple story that I was telling you, that one blocks H, one blocks V, then putting something else in the middle wouldn't matter because that was something blocked more of what was there. And so what's happening is that this simple picture is wrong. And the way it's, one, one way to think about it, it's wrong. And again, so, so, so there are different ways of thinking about it. One way is, is on the level of electromagnetic radiation. I'm gonna give you the quantum way of thinking about it on a single photon by single photon way. The single photon by single photon way is that this active filtering, are really thinking about measuring, we're actually measuring the state of reality of this photon, am I H or V or something else, is actually changing the state of the system. So, so it starts out, for example, in vertical polarization. By acting, by getting through the first filter, it changes it to some other, some other state of polarization. We can call this D or diagonal polarization, which is some combination of H and V. And then getting through the third filter changes it again. So the act of measuring the system changes the system. So this is the, one of the deep mysteries of quantum mechanics. OK, good. Uh, questions about that? OK. Oh, yes. Yes. So what's the magic to produce the filter paper? Good, good. So it turns out that, that this paper, sometimes it's related to something called Polaroid, has long skinny molecules. And the long skinny molecules run like this, okay? And what happens is that when the light hits it, it makes electrons sort of run up and down those molecules, and that tends to absorb the light, okay? So it's related to the chemical composition, the fact that there's a preferred direction. That's why it has an axis associated with it. Yeah, so that's why we can use it. We can use it as an instrument to be able to interrogate this hidden property of light, the polarization. Okay, good. So let me do something kind of fun here. I want to combine the two things we've learned about so far. We've learned about the two-slip mystery. We've learned about polarization or this quantum bit. I want to try to combine them now. And I want to combine them by posing a question to you. Suppose I told you we couldn't, uh, we couldn't figure out if we have the two slits and we have them interfering with each other, suppose I was able to mark those two slits and mark, somehow mark the upper slit and mark the bottom slit, <clears throat> so I knew for sure which way the particle went through the upper or the lower. Now you, yeah, because you might say, look, Professor Jordan, this is all mumbo jumbo. If I did some nice experiment, I could be able to figure out which which particle, which slit the particle went through. And if I did that, then I know where it was, and all this would fall apart. So what, here's one way you could do that. You you could try to mark it by by putting uh, some marks in the paths, and then figuring out whether or not you got this interference effect we've been talking about so far. And uh, the 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 result is, it turns out that uh, will we see still. So so let me ask you: If I did this. Would I still see interference? In other words, would, I, would my experiment act like the bullet example 
or like the wave example? What do you think? I see you thinking over there. What do you think? What do you think? Oh, she's right. So when you observe it, it acts like a particle. And so we can see that. So why don't we, Justin is going to help me again. So, so Justin, why don't you describe what this little bit of paper here is? little bright, the bright and, and dim fringes. Over here, I have a similar wire, but all I've done is put one polarizer on the left-hand side oriented vertically, and one polarizer on the right-hand side oriented horizontally. So the light gets tagged as one or the other, depending on which side of the wire the light goes around. I do the same. So you still see the, this line of light, but there's no longer the bright and dark fringes over there. So it's acting, so the interference effect that you were talking about before is destroyed because I've now marked the path. So I know which way around which, which uh, fringe or which, which uh, path that the light took, so there's no more interference. But now I can ask a further question which is, is there a way to somehow, what happened if there would be a, somehow a way to erase that path marking after I marked it? What then would happen? Would it still act like bullets? No, you would, you're shaking your head. What would happen? It would go back to the way it would. So we're going to use, we're going we're to do the same experiment. And so indeed, if, if we can get it to work properly, which is always a tricky thing in physics demonstrations, so you can see that if I, so I'm gonna, so, so here we're, one is horizontal, the other is vertical. I'm putting it diagonal. So the ones that make it through have now lost their path marking. And you see, well, let's see. Yeah, right there, you see it? You, okay, so if you look carefully, you see the, the fringes, the bright and dark fringes. Yes? That's there. Okay. So, so, okay. All right. Very good. Thank you, Jeff, for, for verifying. I'm not biased on this. <laughs> so that was something profound. So if I, if I have a way of marking the paths, but I have a way of erasing them, so if I mark the paths, the interference goes away. But if I may have a way to erase the path and marking, suddenly the interference comes back. So this is what we call quantum erasure. All right. Uh, good. Okay. Oh my gosh. So we're back to the demogorgon. Oh, all right. So so it, so so the demogorgon is a is a monster in Stranger Things, and it's one of the weird. This is one of the weird Stranger Things that happen. So let's talk about some of the strange things that appear in the quantum world, like the demogorgon. So one of the so one of the famous physicists uh, is, is a guy named John Wheeler, and he has a crazy way of looking at the quantum world, but it's rooted in reality. And so what's his idea? Well, he has a creature sort of like the Demogorgon. It's this thing we'll just call the observer. It's got this weird eye, the stick figure. And what the eye is doing is looking through some pane of glass out of the universe beyond it. And he's sitting there acting as an observer. He's got his hands on his hips. He's just sort of, you know, he's kind of cool, taking it all in. Distant, distant from what's going on. But in the quantum world, Wheeler's vision is that this picture goes away, and I have to replace it by this guy. And this guy is really weird. Right? He's broken through the glass now. His hands have turned into these little meter things that are going around kind of like the Demogorgon going to get you. And, uh, you know, and so what's happening, he's depicting now, is that he's no longer a passive observer. By, active, by the act of observing, by the act of coming in and interacting with the nature, he becomes part of nature. He becomes a, a participant in nature. And so this is, this is the uh, Wheeler's vision of, of the observer. So that's one kind of uh, monster we have in the quantum world. Here's the other monster we mentioned at the beginning of, beginning of, the, of the talk. And I'll talk a little bit more about this now. So this is, uh, this is an example that actually uh, Erwin Schrodinger, this great Austrian physicist, came up with to illustrate how absurd quantum mechanics was. He, he, this was not his, isn't quantum mechanics a great example? He said, this is how stupid 
this interpretation of quantum mechanics is, is because something like this could happen. So let's go walk through it. So, so what are the elements of this? You've got a box. You've got our friendly cat. You have the quantum world represented by this radioactive atom. And the radioactive atom can either decay or not decay. And the idea is that you have a kind of uh, Rube Goldberg device. So the atom, the atom decays, it pulls some, it, it triggers a Geiger counter, which pulls some lever, which releases a, a hammer, which strikes a vial of poison, which kills the cat. So it's this chain reaction of events that progressively larger and larger in size scales. <coughs> so here is the puzzle. We believe, based on experiments, that this radioactive atom can be in a quantum superposition of decayed and non-decayed, just like that particle could be going through the upper slit or the lower slit at the same time. That means the Geiger counter is in a quantum superposition of flick and no flick, which means the hammer is in a quantum superposition of fall and not fall, which means the poison is in a quantum superposition of broken and not broken, and therefore the cat itself is in a quantum superposition of dead and alive. So this was Schrodinger's puzzle, a way of illustrating how absurd taking literally this idea of quantum superposition is. And this idea has been with us for a long time. We've been fighting with it and against it ever since then. So let me kind of unpack a little bit uh, about, uh, so before I talk more about this, do you understand the puzzle? So let's unpack it a little bit. So there are lots of this, this example brings, brings to mind many different problems and questions people have been coping with. So well, the first question is, when does quantum mechanics stop applying to small things, or to, uh, to stop, stop applying to small things and not applying to, to large things, or, or does it? Right? So we talked about that size scale of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is something for really small. But logically, there's literally nothing to prevent this transition from the micro world to the macro world. So is there some kind of quantum classical boundary that's one question. The second one, can, can the cat really ever be in this quantum superposition of alive and dead? Can we take this literally? Another way of saying that is if I take successfully larger and larger objects, can I get evidence that those objects are in fact in quantum superpositions? People have been playing this game for a long time. So not only can people, for example, produce uh, two slit experiments with electrons and photons, but now we've been able to do it with uh, larger atoms and molecules, and even large molecules, like say C60 atoms with 60 atoms, and even now small viruses have been able to be put into quantum superposition in two slit type experiments. So uh, can we take this idea even literally? Okay. So in if so, uh, when is the wave function collapsed? What's the mechanism or what's the physics behind it? Can the cat collapse the collapse his own wave function? Do I have to look? Does it happen when I open the box? Do I have to open the box? Or when the guy, Adam hits the Geiger counter or some other time? All these things are not at all clear. And subsequent research has made it more precise, uh, but there's still a lot of mysteries. Finally, what is this thing called the measuring anyway? This is, this is some measurement thing. What is it? Right? And what is this wave function collapse all about? So these are all kind of mysterious things that we've been struggling with and working with and have a lot of interesting results on. Uh, but these are some of the questions that are still very much in play to this day. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what you read about in a, in, a, in a textbook. So if I look at, when I learned quantum mechanics, when I was in university, I learned from this textbook, sort of a run-of-the-mill book. And if I look at the last page of the book, they have this nice quote uh, talking about three properties of quantum measurements. One is that it's instantaneous, that it happens without any kind of time scale associated with it. It's irreversible. Once you measure, you can't unmeasure. Uh, third, it's projective, uh, which is a technical word, but basically means I, I just both disturb the state and I destroy the state that was originally there. Okay? And there's this nice sort of poetic uh, phrase. However, the making of a record, talking about the process of doing a measure, is essentially an irreversible process. The record is indelible. So think about a permanent marker here. No process exists that will undo a measurement and delete a record, substituting another. That's quite interesting, but it turns out <clears throat> that unless you restrict yourself to a very particular kind of measurement, all of these statements are wrong. <clears throat> and particularly, in particular, one kind of uh, generalization of this concept of measurement 
uh, sometimes called weak measurements or even continuous measurements, and here at Chapman, people work on this kind of thing quite a lot, break all of these properties. It turns out that the measurement can take place over a period of time, it turns out that they can be probabilistically reversed, and it can actually even be minimally disturbing. So all these things are teach telling us that the things that we're taught about measurement is that there's a lot more to the story beyond, beyond that. And here what I mean by generalized or weak measurement is simply when the state of the system in question is imperfectly correlated with the measurement uh, apparatus. Okay, so I want to um, sp spend a little bit more time talking about uh, some of the other weird things about quantum mechanics. The other weird things are the interpretations. So we, in qu in quantum theorists all believe the formalism of quantum mechanics. We all use the same formalism to pre make predictions about the world, and those predictions are extremely precise. They're precise to many, many uh, 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 dec decimal points. For example, if we cal calculate the magnetic moment of an electron, uh, we have a very precise theory. It's perhaps the best scientific theory around. What's embarrassing to us is the fact that almost there is a huge variety of interpretation about what the theory really means. And this is something kind of awkward uh, because it means that even though we know how to calculate, we don't agree about what the meaning or proper understanding of the formalism is. And this is something that is a big problem in the field. And I hope one day, perhaps before I die, we eventually will converge on a better interpretation or maybe a, 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 something new and convincing. But I just want to walk you through some of these ones because these are indeed the stranger things in quantum mechanics. So, so the first one is sort of the original one, so-called the Copenhagen interpretation. And always I can't give justice to all of them because people have written book-length dissertations on all of them. So I'll just talk about a one sentence a catchphrase. Basically it means that the properties of quantum things don't exist until you measure them. So one way of thinking about it is that the moon, if we're not looking at it, doesn't exist. It only exists when you measure. This is the, called the Copenhagen interpretation. By the way, this is probably the dominant interpretation in quantum mechanics. Most operational quantum mechanic, mechanicians believe it. Another one is the Bayesian interpretation. The only reality that's out there is my information about the quantum. Everything else is, uh, is an illusion. So when I learn about some information, I change my mind, it changes the state. Everything else is just a reflection uh, of that. So my information is real, everything else is. Another one is the Bohmian interpretation, which expands my ontology of the quantum world. I don't longer have a particle, which I see. I have something else guiding it that's hidden. The hidden guiding thing is called the pilot wave. And quantum mechanics tells us how this hidden pilot wave behaves, and that pushes the particles around to make them behave the way we see them. Okay, so we have something real, we have something hidden. Uh, and, th and, and that might, and that, but that's appealing in the sense that it's a more realistic interpretation, that there's something real going on, but then there are certain awkward features about this interpretation. One of the things is that the pilot waves turns out have to change instantaneously across the universe to make this happen. Okay, so there are various awkward features of this. All these, all these interpretations have awkward features. Another one is the so-called mini-worlds or Everettian interpretation. <coughs> Every time a measurement happens, the universe splits in two. This is not a joke. Many practicing physicists believe this is true. So it turns out that there are infinitely many parallel worlds. So measurement goes away because simply the fact that the universe branches into two parts that I can't see, one of which is the upside down world in uh, Stranger Things. So, so, so the upside down world in Stranger Things is indeed a multiverse picture of, uh, of, of what's going on. And so this is one parallel universe to our own. Uh, I want to I want to talk also a little bit about quantum non-locality. So so this is another stranger thing. So this was thought up by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, interesting uh, people. Again, trying to challenge the nature of, of, of quantum mechanics and thinking about that it can't be the whole story. There must be something uh, incomplete about it. That if we knew the whole story, we'd be able to have a sort of philosophically satisfying picture of the quantum world. And the, uh, this is sort of like when eleven is able to change control things or see things remotely. It's a bit of a stretch, but, but here's the idea. So the idea is that I can put two particles into something called an entangled state, where I can write them no longer as a product of the two wave functions, but as something non-irreducible. And the idea is that if I separate these particles and take them apart uh, far away from each other, say many light years apart, and I do measurements separately on both parties, 
what happens is that the, I cannot still lo no longer predict what, I can never predict what the results of the measurement of party A is going to be. But the mysterious thing is even though I can't predict that, once I find the particular measurement on party A, I know immediately what must the party B find, even if they're light years away. Okay? So this is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. So um, now, when we talk about non-locality, there's a very precise sense in which this word is used. And this was made much more precise by uh, John Bell in the 1960s. And he, what he did is that he had a, he had a precise uh, theorem that he worked out which is that any kind of realistic, what we call hidden variable theory, that's, that's an that's a underlying reality below quantum mechanics, which we can't see, but we can only, uh, only uh, uh, have interact access to, it has to obey some kind of properties. It has to be, it's, it's a local theory. It's, it, uh, say, uh, that means it's only, it only affects things within the causal uh, speed of light influence zone, and it's also realistic. And so what Bell proved was that if a certain kind of experiment is done with this, with this situation I just described, looking at correlation functions and the results, that if some correlation function is bigger than a certain value, here in, in, in Blackboard it says Einstein, that means that this kind of realistic hidden variable theory Einstein was hoping for would be excluded by experiment in the theorem. And what, what experiment has indeed shown is that this inequality is indeed violated which shows that these kind of local hidden variable theories that are realistic in our classical sense of reality are simply excluded. And so we, so we have to, we're forced on to us this idea of somehow we have a, a non-local quantum reality. All right, um, good. All right, so I, I want to end by just talking about a couple of things. So, so one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And we can we actually under, understand this in a very sim simple ex uh, context. <clears throat> which is it's applied to particles, but we can also apply it to waves. And one kind of wave that we all know about is sound. So what I want to do is I want to try to think about a, 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 not a position momentum uncertainty relation, but a time frequency uncertainty relation, and see how we can make sense of that in a very simple context. So first, I'm going to play a low tone for you here. This is 60 hertz. <coughs> all right. So. What I want to do is I want to start making that tone shorter. And your task is to try to figure out what the pitch is. So we know that was 60 hertz. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to play the same tone with smaller and smaller envelopes. And you're going to think, but see how this tone sounds different from these tones I'm going to play for you. So that's a modulated tone. So you see, it sounds to sound a little bit different here. So here's a very small uh, envelope. Okay. So it begins, hard, it begins harder to be able to tell. Did you hear that? Yeah, I'll play it again. It's kind of funny. Okay, now here is, now, now it's so small, I can't, I have to blow it up for you. So here you see a few wiggles, and here's just a few wiggles. So I'm going to play this last one. So if I just played that for you, would you be able to tell me that's a 60 hertz tone? It sounds like a tap. That's right. So, so, so that, that quality of music, we lose that. And so now you might think this is because I put some kind of funny envelope on it. What happens if I put a square envelope on it? If I did something like a top hat profile, then I would get something like this. How did that sound? Sometimes it sounded much worse than the other one. It sounded almost like a metallic buzz, right? So let's try this one. Okay. So, so this is. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is, the smaller and smaller time duration I have to hear the tone, the more uncertain my identification of the frequency becomes. I lose my ability to to tell you what the frequency of the motion is or of the music. So for example, so for us, the frequency, the longer I hear the tone, the more precisely I can measure it. So the uncertainty relation is delta t, or delta f, is bounded by 1 over 2 pi delta t. If I look at the relative frequency, there's an extra power to f. 
So what I see is that is that uh, that for for example, a 0.1 second duration, it's about a three percent error, whereas for a 0.01 second duration, it's about a thirty percent error. Okay, so, so this gives us our ability to be able to pin down the frequency of the tone. All right, so I'm going to come back to this in just a moment, but I wanted to say, oh yeah, so this is also a point that, that this is, explains why if you play music, if you were trying to play fast music on a low register. You can't play it crisply. It sounds like a, like a muddy sound. Whereas here on the high notes, it's much, it's much crisper because the relative frequency error is much smaller on the high frequency notes. Than the frequency. Okay, so I'm almost done, and then we'll go into questions. But I wanted to say something about something recent. Most of this stuff I'm talking about was back in the 1930s. If I follow the progression of the discovery of physics through the introduction of high energy physics, the introduction of quantum field theory, all this basically happened in the 60s. So what's happened recently? What's going on? Why are we still studying this stuff that we studied basically discovered back in the 1930s? And what I want to stress to you is that even though this is an introductory talk, there's lots of stuff going on recently. Okay? So, so what happened is that people went on to try to figure out what happens at more and more fundamental position scales, so smaller and smaller positions, higher and higher energies, going on into string theory and things like that. They left behind a whole swath of research having to do with the things related to uh, what sometimes is called quantum, uh, uh, <clears throat> well, depending on what you're talking about. But first of all, the foundational questions I've been talking about are very important, but also there's lots of technical questions, sometimes called quantum engineering, or sometimes they call this the second quantum revolution, which is trying to you take the properties of the quantum mechanics that are weird and tame it to be able to do useful tasks for us, like compute faster, or sense, sense better, or simulate things more efficiently. And so these are all very active research areas in quantum mechanics going on right now. I can tell you more about them if you want to know. All right, so for my very last thing, I want to tell you about a new thing, just to show you that things, new things are happening. This is something I published last week. Uh, so this is the, the most up-to-date thing I can tell you about which is we learned before that uncertainty frequency goes like one over the duration of the experiment. And so the question I want to pose to you is, that is there some way that I can apply quantum tricks to be able to speed up a measurement of frequency? So for example, if I want to figure out, I want to calibrate my clock, is my grandfather clock accurate or not? How would I do that? Well, one way I could do that is I could let it tick for say 10 minutes and then count the number of back and forth times and be able to see how accurate my clock is. So with that, the frequency precision scales like one over t, the duration of my experiment. So is there a way I can do quantum tricks to make it better somehow? And here's the trick. I'm going to apply the signal. I'm going to apply it to an atom, two-level atom that I'm going to put in like my superposition of, say, up and down, or 1 and 0, or h and v at the same time. And the question is, can I speed up somehow the estimation frequency which controls the accuracy of my clock. So here is the, what I call quantum dancing. So it turns out what I want to do is I want to arrange it so when the clock pendulum swings one way, I have two energy, I have energy spacing between two levels. When it goes back the other way, I change the energy spacing uh, in, in, a, in a back and forth periodic way. And so here is so that's the basic physics. If I just did that, then it wouldn't work. Basically, my, my precision would still scale like one over the duration of the experiment. So what I need to do is I need to add in a dance. And the dance is the following. The dance is I have a superposition of two states, and when the pendulum goes up to one side, I apply some kind of control pulse that switches the population of my upper state to the lower one, and my lower one to the upper one. And every time I go back and forth like that, I keep switching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as I do that, uh, that will turn out to, and I, then I measure the state of the quantum system, that will give me better accuracy about the frequency of my clock. Now you might say, well, how do I know when to apply these pulses? Because after all, when to apply them depends upon the frequency I'm trying to measure. And that's part of the dance. Basically, if I start dancing with a partner and I start sort of awkwardly dancing, then, uh, th then they don't match, right? And, and, I get, and I get mismatch. And so as I learn the dance, as I learn the right frequency and I go back and forth with my partner correctly, then I get more and more precise estimates of the, the frequency of this oscillation. So this experiment was just published, and here are the results. So the result is that if I don't do this dancing, 
then the precision of the frequency goes like one over t. So this is plotted on a log log scale versus time. This is the uncertainty. This is versus t, that's my data. But when I apply this control, it turns out that I can get a quadratic speed up. So the precision frequency of precision goes like one over t squared. So I get a quantum enhancement in my estimation of the frequency. So with a, either a shorter time or with a more precise estimate, I can speed up my timekeeping uh, using this method. Okay, so that's an example of what, what's going on with the latest and greatest things. OK, so here's my conclusion. Quantum reality can be even stranger than fiction. So the Duffer brothers created this great TV show with the great scary stories. And that's wonderful, but sometimes quantum reality can even be stranger than this fiction. And we've met a number of these stranger things in our path through this uh, discussion. We've met Schrodinger's cat. You know, we'll, we'll talk about quantum paths that travel both possibilities at the same time, quantum locality and this observer participant phenomenon. And then finally, like Eleven was able to finally control the demigorg at the last episode of season one, if we actually know how to behave, these stranger things behave, we can actually control them and use them to develop new kinds of technological advantage. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Well, let's uh, open up the floor for questions. We get to use this really cool technology to see if we can speak. And yeah, it works. So any, any questions? Anything whatsoever? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so please, any, anything would be fine. I'm, I'm talking about anything I talked about or other things in quantum physics as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what would you say is the political significance of uh, operating or ordering the wind observer or the algebraic observer points given um, both under, say, under the idea of picture, but there is some cases. What is ordering? Okay, right. So, 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 so what he's talking about is uh, in quantum mechanics, the, in the formalism that we use, just like I talked about, we don't use position and momentum anymore as, as definite numbers. It turns out in quantum mechanics, those are replaced by uh, something called operators. And the operators, uh, what do they do? They operate. They operate on wave functions. And wave function is the quantum coordinates I was talking about. So one of the weird things about quantum mechanics is that if I had two operators, say position and momentum, uh, th those are no longer definite values. But it turns out those operators, if I if I take my wave function and at first I operate with momentum, and then I operate with moment with position, and I get a certain wave function, that turns out to be different than if I reverse the order of that. First I operate with say what did I say position and then momentum, I get something different. Okay. So that's a fundamental feature of quantum mechanics that's very important uh, for, 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 for many reasons. So the physical significance of that, um, well, it, it, so it turns out that that underlies, for example, the uncertainty principle. So I talked about the uncertainty principle, the fact that the uncertainty in position and the uncertainty in momentum must be always bigger than or greater than one half. So we can think of, see that as a consequence of something deeper with respect to the operator order. So the fact that if I take xp operator and I subtract px operator, that turns out to be the identity times Planck's constant. That turns out to be a deeper realization. So in some sense, the fact that there is momentum energy, I'm sorry, momentum position uncertainty relation comes more fundamentally from this operator non-commutivity you're talking about. So, so that's, that, that's one important concept. Yeah, so if, you, so if you bring, so, yeah, so, so indeed, so if you bring measurement in, what happens is suppose I measure first one operator and then I measure another operator that don't commute. What happens is that I collapse first to the eigenstate or, or to, the, to this particular value of the first operator first, and then I have a collapse to the operator of this other operator. So the fact that, I, so, so here's one deep consequence of the non commutivity. The point is, is that if, if those operators commuted, I kept measuring. I get the same quantum state every time. I get state, 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 and they all be the same. So you know, I mean backpack. I look, I look, I look, the backpack is always the same. 
If I measure a non-commuting basis, like I measured, you know, for example, I measured HV versus diagonal anti-diagonal for photons, what I find is that can't happen. I have to continuously change the state of the quantum system. The fact that the state is going to be changed and disturbed in a fundamental way comes from that non-commutivity of what I measure. Okay, other questions? I have a question. I kind of talked about how, like, at some level, the more your audience will understand what you mean on the page, the properties, do we know when that cooperative is still possible? Yes, yeah, so it's a good, great question. So, so he asks, when, when does quantum mechanics stop applying? So if I look around us, like looking around our room, I can describe our world perfectly well with Newtonian physics for the most part, maybe electromagnetism for, 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 for good measure. I don't need to talk about wave functions and states and all that stuff. So at what size scale do things break down? And so that's an active level of research. So I mentioned this, this example where people have done the Tussle experiment that I mentioned before with things like buckyballs and viruses, and they do manage to find interference effects. Now what happens is, is that when you get to those really big objects, it becomes very hard to isolate it from the environment. So one of the things that you need to be able to see this effect is you need to isolate those systems from interactions with other degrees of freedom in my environment, and that tends to destroy this effect I'm looking for. So one of the open questions is, is it just because we can't isolate the cat, for example, sufficiently well from the environment, that if we could do that, could we really put a cat in superposition between alive and dead? And that's still an open question. Maybe it's possible. So the biggest thing people have made to date uh, it turns out not to be individual objects like uh, atoms or, uh, or molecules, but collective things, things that have to do with many particles. So one, one of the examples is people work with superconducting systems and superconducting circuits that you can build on a chip, okay? And what you find there is that you can have quantum superpositions of, say, currents flowing in a ring one way versus currents flowing in a ring the other way. That, and those currents involve millions of what are called Cooper pairs, which is an elementary excitation of the superconductor. So that's an example of a macroscopic quantum object. And another example is what they call a Bose-Einstein condensation. This is when you have a bunch of bosons and you cool them to a very, very cool temperature, and they act like a collective, collective variable, sort of like the hive mind of the of the Stranger Things, right? If you have like a collective thing, and that, and so we can describe this, this with a single wave function that describes the entire uh, collective behavior of all those bosons. Okay, other questions? Yeah, so how do you do it? Uh, so it's very simple. It, nature does it all the time for us without us having to do anything. Uh, for example, in this example that I gave with the two slits, right? If I just, if I just send my particle through this, through this uh, apparatus, it automatically is in a superposition. So for example, left or right. So as long as there's a possibility for that system to be in that case, I have to allow that quantum reality. So more generally, if a something can happen, it has to be included as a possibility in your quantum state. So if I, we talked about maybe three slits or four slits, if I can go here, 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 or here, my quantum state involves all those things at the same time. So it happens just automatically. It's just the way nature works. We don't have to do anything special for that to happen. It just, it just, it's, it's just part of our reality. And that's why Richard Feynman liked to say, I can't explain quantum mechanics to you. I can just tell you how it works. And that's what we can do. We can just describe nature as we find it. So when you're using, like, kind of creation of the quantum, what do you basically see in that? What do you, like, what are you measuring in order to do, like, the dance or whatever? What are you, what are you measuring in order to find that? Yeah, so what you're measuring in, so in my dance example, so what you're measuring in the end is that, um, so it turns out, maybe I can write something on the board. So I, I told you that I can have, you know, in these two-state examples, I can have these two states, zero or one, right here, over here, or I can have something like zero plus one over here, and say zero minus one over here. So these are different quantum realities that can all exist simultaneously. I can represent that as a circle or as a sphere. And so 
So, and, and so we get a state is some point on the sphere. And so what happens in my quantum dance is it turns out the state is like an arrow pointing at one of these surface, surface, uh, surfaces on the sphere. And the dynamics of the clock is that it makes this, this arrow go around uh, this sphere, okay? And what happens is that essentially what I'm doing, I'm picking up some quantity, which is essentially telling me how much angle or rotation I go along in this space, and that angle we call quantum phase. So what's happening in this example I told you about is that we have this quantum phase. It turns out that if you do the dance just right, it depends upon the frequency of the oscillation in a very sensitive way. So what you do at the end of the day is, so, so, here, so here's the detailed protocol. You start, say, here. You apply a pulse that brings you up to here. Then you let the, the, the dance happen for some time. And then at the end of the day, you, you take your pulse and you bring it back down. And I make a measurement, mi0 or 1. And that measurement tells you very sensitively what this phase was, what this dancing thing was doing, and that and that allows you then to infer what this what this frequency was. So it's it's the so it's the it's the dynamics of the dance that eventually get read off by how often I'm in zero or one. That's what you read out. following on the first question this that uh, Charles went out. Um, he was asking about the, the Heisenberg and the relations, these weird things called operators. So um, one question is, um, are we talking, is the Heisenberg and certainty relation this kind of fuzziness? Is this something that's really comes about because of the way we're looking at the world? Like, you know, if I, if I suddenly have to start wearing black, like if I, take my wife's glasses since I have 20, 20 vision, I don't be able to see a thing, right? It looks all fuzzy. But the world, when I take my glasses off, is not fuzzy. But maybe, uh, so that's a property of the glasses, right? But maybe um, this so-called fuzziness is not just a result of the way we look at the world, but it's, that's really the way the world is. It is fuzzy. Yeah, and that, and that gets back to the heart of these einstein bohr debates, right? Which was, Einstein was saying, you know, his famous expression, I can't believe God plays dice with the universe, is believed that there had to be some underlying deterministic reality to which quantum mechanics was some kind of statistical approximation to. And that's something we don't know. What we do know is some of the things I mentioned in the talk is that we can cert put certain kinds of bounds on what those hidden theories that we don't know about might look like. So the bell bound is, is one important one. It says if you had a local theory, that have this kind of hidden reality to it that we can't see, then there certainly have to be certain constraints. It can't be a local hidden variable theory. It had to be something like a non-local hidden variable theory. And so, it, so I think there's still a lot of room open for more fundamental physics that we don't know about. But we now have, but, but, but there are certain constraints that are sort of hemming it in the kinds of the kinds of possibilities that you really see. Do you have a nice uh, monster stick figure to give us some sense of how strange that? Not what the world would be. Uh, I think I sh showed one, right? So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think I've had enough monster pictures. Okay. <laughs> so, you know. It would be strange, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's give our speaker a hand again. And stay tuned. Um, Actually, uh, uh, Andrew is giving another popular talk with one of his collaborators, uh, Kater Merch, on December 14th, 15th. December, what? 15th. December 15th. Um, and that will be uh, about time and, and stranger things that happen over the same yeah. time in the yeah. psychoscopic world. So, 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 so that will be interesting because it's going to have three people involved. Yeah. So I'll be representing the theory component of the team. My colleague Caleb Merch is an experimentalist, so he'll be giving you the hands-on technical point of view. And then we have a philosopher, Alyssa Ney, who'll give the philosophical point of view, all about the meaning of time and how it interplays with quantum mechanics. So we're, we're, we're pulling out all the stuff they're bringing in Andy's whole team from around the world. All right, we'll do it. Thank you, Matt. Okay.
Thank you again.